Matt DeCourcy is the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Canada. He's also the MP Liberal for Fredericton Oromocto area. Our conversation touched on many things. Specific details, not so much. More we talked about process. In general terms, we tend to think of our elected officials as making decisions on our behalf. But maybe what actually happens is they spend more time working on the process and following the wishes of their electorate. Hope you enjoy the conversation. So thanks for taking the time. I appreciate you're probably pretty busy. Dennis, thanks for having me back. This is uh, this is the third time we've been able to sit down, I think almost about two years apart on relative clockwork. So it's great to be back. And your hair color hasn't started to change yet. It's always uh, been one of those. I grew out a beard a little bit over the holidays um, while there was a bit of downtime. And I am starting to notice some gray hairs it's as gray. well as in my sideburns. But I'll probably lose it all before it goes completely gray <laughs> anyway, given my genealogy. So Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Because that's one of those things when you're in the public eye and people are taking pictures over time. Probably uh, former President Obama was the most noticeable yeah. with what his hair looked like when he started and, and the gray that kicked in by the time he was done. Hopefully you'll you'll fare better. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the the stress-inducingness that, that leads to gray in many ways is a good thing, especially for somebody who enjoys being around the community enjoys being with people yeah. um th there are challenging things that we do uh, but i always tell people the good things are really good and the challenging things are good because they get you out of bed in the morning to to work yeah. on behalf of people yeah. and i started on the soft side because it frustrates me that people forget that you're a person once you become <laughs> an mp or an mla or a still matt to city council person um, we tend to objectify our politicians to a fairly high degree. There's a lot of um, negative vibe at times around being a politician. Um, you can probably find a poll somewhere that shows where politicians rank in things that they trust. And, and that's such a misdirection because what's really going on is the conversation needs to get a lot better to understand what you go through and what the dynamic's like. So it's almost like a peek into the huddle or a peek into the locker room. Yeah. So can you share with us in the, in the past two years, roughly, um, what's the high point of your learning curve from you're on the outside, I want to become the MP? Right. And not, now I am, and you're in the thick of it now. Absolutely. Um, I, I think one of the greatest lessons that I've learned um, over the course of running for office and now having been in office for a little over two years is the importance of relationship building. Um, and, and I don't think it's unique to politics or government at all. I think if people were to step back and look at the field in which they operate, the work they do, the lives they lead, they would acknowledge hmm. um, that decisions get made and things get moved when people develop rapport and a level of trust and build relationships uh, amongst each other. So uh, for me, it's been tremendously important when I'm in Ottawa to build good relationships with colleagues, both uh, within the government side as well as opposition colleagues to help uh, move things um, that are within the government's agenda, but also different legislative and committee matters forward. And when I'm home in Fredericton, to be available to people to build on relationships uh, to help advance the priorities of the community and the communities that I get to represent. So that's been probably the height of lessons the top lesson that I've learned over the last couple of years. And um, and if I were to um, share with uh, anyone who was thinking about a life in the public eye, I would say go out and do the things that you want to do to experience the world, but take care of building good relationships with people regardless of where they are and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two different communities, Fredericton and Ottawa. Yes. Can you uh, map us out what it's like between the two? Sure. I, I, I guess the way I would look at it, um, not so much in the in the different communities, but the, the different um, activities that, that I undertake when I'm in Ottawa vis-a-vis -vis Fredericton. Uh, for the last year, I've had the opportunity to work as the parliamentary secretary to Christopher Freeland, our foreign minister. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my days in Ottawa over the last year have been... Um, busy um, getting briefed on matters of international significance and 
on Canada's place within those uh, dynamic challenges that the world is facing. Uh, busy meeting with incoming delegations of uh, ambassadors, uh, foreign officials, as well as not-for-profit organizations who do uh, work in the realm of diplomacy or international development around the world, uh, human rights building uh, being a, a really significant mm -hmm. uh, aspect of that. Um, I've had now a year's worth of question periods to be prepared for and be on my feet answering to the opposition about the government's position on a range of matters when uh, when the minister, when Christia is traveling and, and unable to be in the house. Um, and on top of that, I follow as a as an associate member the uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee. So the work of that committee, both in examining different uh, situations um, in 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 areas of the world that are undergoing conflict or or human development issues and moving legislation through that committee uh, in a way that uh, meets the needs of parliamentarians and uh, and moves the government's agenda forward. So um, again, a lot of relationship building involved in those activities. At the same time, when I'm in Ottawa, uh, I have to find time to advance the priorities of our region, both both the Fredericton and Oromocto and, and Greater Grand Lake uh, community, as well as you know the economic growth objectives of our province and of um, uh, of the region, and um, and so finding that balance in Ottawa um, has been, quite frankly, it's been fun to to figure that out, and uh, and then to get home on a Friday, <laughs> to be available at the market Saturday morning and meet with people either at a range of activities that take place around the community. Or um, schedule, you know, meetings with with different uh, interested uh, individuals, groups, and stakeholder organizations. So that's the general thrust of the dynamic between the two for those. What effectively turns into three out of four weeks, eight months of the year that the house sits. Uh, the other time of the year, uh, you know, mid December to the end of January, I'm largely in Fredericton, safe some travels on mm -hmm. the foreign affairs file. And that's the same thing from the, for the summer, generally in Fredericton, mm -hmm. um, save for some international travels uh, to represent the government and the minister. Great. Thanks for that. Um, people will get what they get out of media, assuming they pay attention to media. Media will put things into a certain framework. And we often don't hear what day-to-day -day life is like or what what the drill or the routine is like. So thanks for sharing it. You know, broad strokes, this is kind of what it's like when you become a, an MP. Yeah, I mean, just, just to maybe tie that off, um, I rely heavily on the people who work with me, both in a formal capacity within my <laughs> office. I mean, yeah. they are the face of Matt DeCourcy when I am not there, and I've been tremendously uh, privileged to have wonderful people working with me to help resolve individual cases for people in the community who, who have challenges receiving the services to which they're entitled by the government, mm -hmm. um, helping advance projects that are of significant importance, um, and and ensuring that um, through communications activities that I'm able to communicate with people, you know, both directly and in a mediated way. So that's important. My family uh, is always there to support me. Uh, even as simply as having food in the fridge uh, when I when I drive in from the airport on a Friday night, because often there's nothing in my fridge, yeah. um, and uh, and the volunteers who continue to be supportive of me are tremendously important uh, to my ability to serve the community. Well, that sets up uh, the next question where I wanted to go play a bit because sure. um, one day you're Matt, and the next day you're MP, and. And now you're parliamentary secretary mm -hmm. of foreign affairs. The learning curve must be phenomenal. And therefore, around you, there must be such a good team. Because when media get a hold of you, they start to treat you as if you're the expert because you're the spokesperson. Right. And, and there's no way that any human under any conditions can go from, you know, this was my life up to this point in time. And in an 18-month window, it turns. And now I have to be the spokesperson for all this. So the, the, can you... 
walk us into a bit of the team that you would have in Ottawa that gives you, because that's where we need to trust the civil service again. Sure. And, and to know that that expertise is there. And, and while media might, might want to look for a conflict storyline in a narrative between conservative, liberal, NDP, um, we need to build a trust again back into that civil service that no matter who's in power, there's a stability there and sure. a skill set there that's significant. Dennis, that's a great point to raise. And, and again, I've learned a lot about that dynamic over these last two years. Um, subject matter expertise exists within our civil service on a whole range of issues. I've had the enormous pleasure of working with uh, really capable, uh, experienced, knowledgeable, both in depth and breadth of subject uh, people working at Global Affairs Canada. These are people who have served uh, in our missions abroad. These are people who have vast experience working on development issues in conflict zones as complicated as Iraq, uh, Syria, uh, Iran, uh, the situation in Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis the, you know, the threat posed by Russia, uh, who understand the dynamic of um, the rise of the middle class in China, mm -hmm. who have experience um, dealing with challenging situations in places like Venezuela, which is an ongoing humanitarian and political crisis. I am wowed at the quality of the briefings I get from these people when I need to be brought up to speed on a, on a certain issue ahead of meeting with somebody to talk about our yes. mutual interests and or where there's daylight between the view of Canada and the view of, of, of another um, state they're incredibly capable and knowledgeable and I have a ton of respect for them. At the same time, I've learned that the civil service needs to rely on elected officials who come from communities right across the country and who, when they're doing their job best, have a beat on, uh, on both the emotions uh, and the views and the opinions of citizens in their communities. Hmm. And when we get that right, I think we're at our best as a government. Um, I think there there can be there can be positive conflict in there trying to work out issues, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it won't surprise you for me to say uh, I believe in the vision and the thrust of our government, but I think there's a good dialogue that takes place between the government and and the opposition politicians and the civil service to come to a right spot on issues, and we won't always get it exactly right, but we will do our best and. And, uh, and I'm of the view, and, and my sense is largely people in this region are of the view that there's a general movement in the right direction to build more inclusive structures for people uh, in our communities. And, and I think that comes when we respect the civil service, when we respect uh, views of all political stripes, and when we consult with civil society and individuals as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Uh, it's it's important. And can I, can I add to that as well? I've had the chance to travel abroad about a half. I've had the chance to travel abroad maybe four times, and and around Canada, uh, in my role as parliamentary secretary, accompanied by you know senior officials from Global Affairs, and they are so well respected, uh, in in the global arena for for their expertise in diplomacy and, and working on complicated geopolitical issues. And I have a, an enormous respect for them. Quite the exposure you had. Too bad you couldn't wear a, a body cam or something and, and let us follow and learn without That's a good idea. country secrets. <laughs> One of the things that may need to happen over time is the demystifying of what the civil service does, the relationship between political end of it and the civil service side of it so that a country can rebuild a, a sense of trust and a sense of shared vision again that media, and I want to put a lot of it on their shoulders, they tend to have that conflict narrative. And it might be that we need to get on with a cooperative narrative. We can have differences in the directions we might want to go. Sure. But in general terms, we know we need to go there because mm -hmm. we're one of the most fortunate countries in the world. Mm -hmm. And if we keep nurturing this conflict model, we're going to implode ourselves. I, I, I will say... Um I, I have been exposed to really professional media personalities um, who do a good job at holding us to account while at the same time being fair in the way they portray um, a certain issue or a story. And uh, I, I believe in the role that the media plays in, in holding 
A, holding governments to account and B, um, giving Canadians and the general public hmm. access to issues. Uh, sometimes uh, it's not always portrayed the way, I, you know, my my view of the issue is, but yeah. uh, the media do play a valuable role. And, and when we're fair with all of those different parties, I, I do think we're at our best. Yeah, that nurturing and of the, and we do a lot we do it a lot better in Canada than some places around the world. Yeah, I mean we can just look south and watch uh, the the challenges the United States are going through. No matter which narrative you want to pick, if you move back one more step from all the detail and just watch the patterns, uh, there they've got some work to do in order to get back what was you know the United States and its culture and its vision shared at a certain scale. So I, you don't need to wander into that, but there, there's. I didn't want to put you in a box, but we're at, we're in this really interesting window where things are changing. Large systems are shifting, uh, aging population or younger people looking for stability. Most of the systems that have got us through from the 50s have kind of run their course. And they, we need to start building this new way. And this building this new way is going to take a cooperative mindset more than a competitive I want to win mindset. So it'd be nice if voters voted for a vision um, rather than voting for the the chit or well, you'll never be in power so why would i vote for you there there's a connection between the cultural shift of a shared vision and the behavior pattern on the four-year election cycle and mm -hmm. the civil service creates the stability through all that right i uh, you know the uh, uh, i think political parties are important vehicles in laying out visions and and yes there are tangible um, action items that that form a part of that vision, but but you're right. We need to at the same time rely on uh, on the expertise of the civil service, working in concert with industry, with academia, with civil society, and with individuals to help move the vision down to the level where things you know are put into to place programmatically or project wise or service delivery wise. Yeah. I took a roundabout route to get to public trust, nurturing public trust from several different angles. Um, to pick up, for instance, where media would have a role to play, and you would have been sitting in it, might have been one of the first ones that, that uh, wait a second, you guys promised, and now you're not going to do it, is the electoral reform thing, which is a, you know, a little while ago now. And so it's not about the details of it. It's more about the, the process of how does a country come to shift its fundamental process of democracy like does that kind of make sense because to get into electoral reform i don't want to get into the details mechanics and stuff i want to get into the root principle about is the country ready yet for doing something like this or that assumes the current system's broken but maybe if we had 80 or 90 percent participation rates maybe <laughs> the system isn't broken yet. right and and you sat right in that cusp of i had a tremendous experience with that uh i i I wouldn't have traded that experience as one of the first things that I got to do as a parliamentarian for anything. I had tremendous exposure to a fascinating issue hmm. uh, that is much more complex than it has been allowed to be portrayed to people. Mm -hmm. I got to develop some really good relationships with colleagues within my own party and within all the opposition parties. I got to travel the entire country mm -hmm. and meet with Canadians in all provinces and all three territories. I got to listen to um, foreign officials talk about their experiences with their electoral systems and their democratic process. Um, and, uh, and so as, as a matter of learning, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Uh, I'm comfortable with, with where we came to on this. Uh, some of my takeaways are that... Um, our system is not perfect, uh, but it is strong. Mm. Uh, it is built upon certain values that um, I believe are important. I, I believe that uh, local representation and proximity to people uh, in communities is an important element of our democratic process, that people know who their elected official are. And I believe in this part of the country, that's um, even more acute. Mm -hmm. um, I am of the view that any democratic reform should encourage greater participation and that speaks to in one instance greater voter turnout um, and through our committee process uh, we were exposed to evidence to suggest that 
uh, electoral systems across the Western world, regardless of what system they are, are all experiencing a trend in voter decline. Yeah. So simply by changing the system, uh, there's no evidence to suggest that that gets resolved. Yeah. It might not be the solution to the challenge. Right. And, and, and the other thing that, that we came to understand is there's a level of education about the democratic process that needs to be elevated within, um, I guess, the knowledge of, of more Canadians. Not yeah. enough Canadians understand what our system is comprised of now, let alone what another system might be comprised of. And so Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.